drum? Yeah. Dude, last time I did that, I like knocked down a guitar. Yeah. <laughs> I remember so, uh, that. Sorry about that, Andrew. Not repeating history. Okay, well like Bree said, my name's Jose Zalba. This is my fourth semester here at Pack Room. Uh, yeah. Dude, how time flies, it's crazy. Um, but I am getting my degree in Bible and pastoral ministry, and I'm one of the leaders here at Pack Room. Can I just, um, before I open, sorry, can I just pray? Yeah. Thank you, Lord God, Abba Father. Mm. What a call it is to preach your word, God. Lord, I do not come here and take this honor lightly. But Lord, I just pray that in this space that I may not speak of my own volition, but I may speak the words that you give me, God. Lord, I pray just, Holy Spirit, may you just fill this place. May you speak to your children today, God. Whatever they're strongly struggling with, Lord, you know their every thoughts, their every deeds, their every actions. So, Lord, may you just speak to your children today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 All right, like I said, my name is Jose, uh, fourth semester here at Pack Rim. And I'm one of the leaders here at chapels. So we have, this is our first student-led chapel, yeah. guys. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, so we put on chapels every Thursday, completely led by students. We have like a preaching, teaching team, uh, worship, which always just brings in the presence of God, amen. Uh, we got tech side over there with pro -pres and sound, and then we have hospitality there in the back, and it's completely student-led. So we have one team of all students that comes here and serves every week and puts on service. And last semester, we kind of um, just wanted to talk a little bit about what God did last semester, because there's so many like testimonies that God released, and even in my own life, um, God just did a mighty work through chapels last semester. Um, Garrett, if you guys know Garrett, gave the first message. Say hi, Garrett. Hi, Garrett. <laughs> uh, but Garrett, um, and the leadership team kind of got together last semester and they were praying uh, with the Lord just about a theme for chapels last semester and they came up with the theme of abiding. Abiding out of John 15, where Jesus gives the parable of him being the true vine, God the Father being the vine dresser, us or the disciples being the branches. Um, and basically for that whole semester, people kind of like spoke around the theme or like it would be brought up and stuff, but it was just crazy the way that God orchestrated things. Because people would come in and like, you'd be like, did you look at my sermon notes? You know what I mean? <laughs> or you'd like, somebody would preach one week and then somebody else the next week and the next. And it was just like building on top of one another. And you could tell like, it wasn't of our own, like we, there's no way we could have coordinated that. Right. It was like an orchestration from God. Yeah. And even like a guest speaker came in wow. and he spoke wow. about the same thing. Yeah. And it was just like wrapped it all up. It was crazy. You know what I mean? So I just, I kind of wanted to say that just to affirm, like, yes. we have a theme for chapels this year, and God's going to just do the same thing, okay? Um, so this year, uh, Garrett and the team kind of got a word out of Romans chapter 5 and, and 6, um, and basically it was like segmented into three different parts. The first was spiritual empowerment. The second was suffering with Christ or endurance. And the third being servanthood. Um, and I'm not going to go too deep on it because we're going to talk for the next 12 weeks about that stuff. So just show up next week and you'll hear more about the rest. But I'm going to be talking about spiritual empowerment today. And where God took me for this um, started in the book of John, John chapter 2. But God took me to this concept of a spiritual mind versus a carnal mind. Yeah. It's expanded later on in scripture, but if we could all open up to John chapter 2. And I'm sorry, I don't, I didn't put slides or anything, so <laughs> bring your Bibles. <laughs> 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 Could 
conviction. No. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just open your Bibles if you don't have, like, just go on your phone. Or if not, just like listen, because I'm reading it. Please listen, anyways. <laughs> um, and just a quick note about the Gospel of John. John, in his Gospel, there's a lot of like unique events that he talks about that aren't mentioned in the other three Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels. John just has unique events that he mentions in his Gospel, and they kind of, like these, these stories have very deep theological concepts and themes that you'll see throughout the entire Gospel of John. So it's like a theme that you'll start and then you'll just carry it out through the rest of the Gospel, just so like, like, do you get it now? Do you get it now? Like that kind of thing. Um, so in John chapter two, verses one to 11, this is a story that a lot of us may know. Um, Jesus at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Amen. 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 This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. So just a quick overview of the story, right? Jesus walks into this wedding. He's at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And he's there with his mother, his disciples, maybe his brothers. We're not entirely sure. Um, but he walks in and his mother tells him um, that they're running out of wine. At the wedding, they, they begin to run out of wine. Um, and just just to know, um, wine, like a lot of us like from evangelical traditions, maybe like in the Western church, it's like, oh, wine, <laughs> you know, like drunkenness, ah. But like wine in the Old Testament, like not drunkenness, drunkenness is a sin, but wine is representative of like blessing and joy, like God's blessing. Um, Proverbs 3.10, Psalm, it's in the Psalms, different places. But they're running out of wine. And this is super symbolic, and I wanna get us to like, get this picture. When they're running out of wine, this is like representing the spiritual state of early first century Judaism. So like the world that Jesus was born and brought into, like this story is kind of like talking about the spiritual state of like where it is that they're running out of wine. They're running out of like, the wine, which is God's blessing, his joy for his people. They're running low. And Jesus' mother comes up to him and he's like, they're running out of wine. And he's like, woman, <laughs> what does your concern have to do with me? For my hour has not yet come. Um, a lot of times before when I thought about this story, uh, my hour has not yet come, I would think about, oh, the hour for his ministry. He was like, oh, this is the beginning of the manifestation of his glory. He's about to start his earthly ministry walk around, heal people, raise the dead, all that stuff. But actually, um, what he's talking about right here is his crucifixion. My hour has not yet come. John repeats this seven times in the gospel. My hour has not yet come. And he's talking about his crucifixion. So we know that, okay, they're running out of wine. This is talking about the spiritual state of like where and what time Jesus was born into. My hour has not yet come. So Jesus is talking about his crucifixion. So this sign is pointing towards that. So like what he's doing through his crucifixion. 
And I think just something that is so important that I want us to just grasp from this story is that Jesus turns the water into wine. And what this reveals to us is that Jesus can change things in nature. Like that's the, the character of God, the character of Jesus Christ, is that he changes things in nature. And this is representative of his ministry, what he came to do. And we'll get deeper into that. Uh, I'm just going to take us on a journey through scripture. Do it. Okay? Just going to talk about stories and bring them up. But just let's all just take this journey and this walk together. Okay? Bring it's not going to be like stop, start, stop. It's just going to be going. Bring right? Bring so after this, Jesus comes, he goes to Jerusalem. And he goes to the Passover. And, a conf and we see that a conflict begins to arise between Jesus and, in this story, the Jews. Jesus comes to the Passover. And he goes to Jerusalem. And then he goes to the temple. And in the outer courts of the temple, the Gentile courts, he sees people that are money changers. People that are selling oxen. People that are selling sheep and pigeons. Jesus makes a whip of cords. And he starts driving them out. And like the people are like, what are you doing? Like, this is normal for us. They don't understand what Jesus is doing. So then he has this kind of like discourse with them. And this is John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. It says, So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So this is like, this is a conflict that starts right here. And this is the beginning of it, and it leads literally to Jesus' crucifixion. Like we just see exchanges between Jesus and the Jews and Pharisees and like even in conversations with different people, like there's just a conflict that arises and we'll unpack that a little bit. But this is the beginning of it. And what's happening here is like Jesus is talking like up here. Yeah. But the Jews are like yeah. understanding right here. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Like Jesus is saying, like, destroy this temple and in three days. I'll raise it again. Like Jesus is talking about like his crucifixion and his victory over sin and death, which literally from Genesis to Revelation, all of the book of the Bible, all of the history of humankind is leading to this. The victory over sin and death, the ultimate enemy. This is what Jesus is talking about. And the Jews are like, well, it took us 46 years to build this temple. You know what I mean? Like they're like Jesus is talking up here, and like the the Jews in this scenario are just like they're not understanding. And this is just a conflict that keeps on happening throughout the whole book of John. Jesus would just be talking about these crazy, like great spiritual revelations. And people would just be like, what are you even talking about? Like right after this, John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Yeah, go there. He says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is like, oh, like... How can one be born when he is old? Can he climb back into his mother's womb? You see, you see how like Jesus is talking up here and, and Nicodemus is is right there and, and Jesus says, one who is born of the uh, unless one is born of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Those who are born of the flesh are flesh, those who are born of the spirit are spirit. wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes such are those who are born again wow. of the spirit yeah but like jesus is talking about the day of pentecost and this new nature that he is creating us into being born again of the spirit like god dwelling inside humans and nicodemus is like how can I climb back into my mother's womb? It's like this different level of understanding. And I don't even just want to pick on the Jews and the Pharisees right now. Go to the Samaritan woman. And even Jesus' disciples, like, right? Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman. And she's like, um, 
Oh, like the Jews uh, say that you worship in Jerusalem, but we worship on this mountain under at like uh, the well of Jacob. And Jesus is like, well, the Jews worship in Jerusalem. Salvation is of the Jews. So we know who we worship. We say a new day is coming and now is. Where no longer will you go to the mountain to worship or no longer will you go to Jerusalem. But like, there will be those who will like, worship in spirit and in truth. Yeah. The true worshipers will come. That's good. Where it's like this different level of revelation where she's still talking physically, right? 46 years, it's a physical thing. Entering into the mother's womb, it's a physical thing. Going to the mountain or going to Jerusalem, it's a physical thing. But Jesus is like, no, I want to get you out of that mindset of the physical and get you to a heavenly mindset. Like even right after his disciples, she, she goes to the town and she's like preaching about Jesus being the Messiah. And his disciples come up to him and they're like, oh, are you hungry? Like you have anything to eat? And he's like, you don't know. Like I, I have food that you don't know. And it's to do the will of my father. Yeah. Where they're still talking about things like physical, like a physical, like plate lunch. They're talking about like food. And Jesus is like, no, I'm doing the will of my father. Or it's just this different, like, I'll just, uh, I'll bring a comparison. And this isn't, I don't want to like minimize it. Because this is just a huge, like hugely important topic. I just want to do it like just conceptually so we can understand. Like it's like a computer. Like it's just a, a different operating system, right? Like if you put a memory chip, like it's just a different way of thinking. It's a different way of operating in this life that Jesus is talking about and that Jesus is walking in. And this is what we are called to, is to put away this one way of thinking and to enter into a new one. And this is the wine. <laughs> The new wine that Jesus is pouring out. The new wine. He's changed our nature. He's changed our nature. Yeah. You just all opened uh, Romans 8. Because Paul talks about this quite a bit. Talks about being led by the Spirit. Versus the flesh. So this is like, because it's, I just wanted to bring this up for us to know and like reference it in the gospels so much to like know like, this was like a main part of Jesus' ministry. Like this is what Jesus was talking about. Like Jesus went around all Galilee and he said that he was preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom of heaven. Right? So a place that I just want to get to us, us to is thinking about the spiritual mind thinking about the kingdom of heaven and the carnal mind and what that's thinking about. So in Romans 8, 5 to 6, and I think this just emphasizes the importance of this concept. It's not, and it, when I say concept, I mean something that you live by. It's not just something you understand, it's something that you live by. Okay? Romans 8, 5 and 6, it says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. This is how important this is. To be spiritually minded is life and peace, but to be carnally minded is death. You guys read the book of Ecclesiastes and Solomon talks about like, this concept of everything that is under the sun, under the sun, that, that will pass away. Like you look at our flesh, like our, our physical body, like in Genesis 2, it, we're, we're, we're made out of the Adama, the dust of the earth, yeah. like our flesh, like everything that is under the sun that is not in the kingdom of God, everything that is under, under the sun, physical, like Nations. Put our, we don't put our faith in nations because they're going to pass away. Like everything that is under the sun that is physical, my body will one, be, one day be in the dirt. But the good thing is, good news says that I'll have a new body, new spirit. But this is, this is the mindset that I want to kind of get us out of, is thinking in these terms. 
in terms of the flesh. Come on. In terms of the flesh. And thinking about things from a kingdom perspective. So what does that mean? Because like, these are like, like you know, high level concepts, and a lot of times like we could believe these things, but it's like, how do I live this out? You know what I mean? I think two things are very important to understanding the the spiritual mind versus the carnal mind. The first thing is that the spiritual mind yeah I think it it just shows itself in two different ways one is like characteristically so like what the Bible talks about being conformed to the image of Christ we'll kind of talk about that characteristically like you becoming more like Jesus that's the spiritual mind like having the mind of Christ living like Jesus being transformed, being renewed. Okay? So that's one thing, characteristically. But I think the other is like the mission. The mission of what Jesus was trying to accomplish. And this is something that I feel like we just lose in church a lot. Where it's like, even we approach like character growth in a non-spiritual way, yeah. first of all, which is like, yeah. I'll get to that later. Yeah. Either we do that, or like in the missional thing, like we are, so much of the church is trying to build their own castles. When Jesus came to build the kingdom. You know what I mean? Like that's what the flesh is. The flesh is that you are the king of your life. The kingdom is that Jesus is the king of your life. The flesh wants you to satisfy yourself. It's like a filling sensation. It's like me, 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 me. The kingdom is about God and what he's doing. What he's doing through you and what he's doing in you. So we'll just start with the characteristically thing. Just talk, talk about character. Like become, becoming more like Jesus. The new wine that he's pouring out. Galatians 5, chapter 16 to 26. And this is something that we talk about a bit in church, the fruit of the spirit, right? I have not heard many sermons about the works of the flesh. Gotta be honest. So we could just open to Galatians 5, chapter, six, uh, chapter 5, 16 and 26. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. <laughs> For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, so tune into this, these are the works of the flesh. It says adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Let's just pause there. Can we just all go over that list again? The works of the flesh. And I want like, if you're taking notes or anything, or like just mental notes, Think about which one of these you fall into. Because it's easy to be like, oh, like I'm not a murderer. Like I didn't commit adultery. But do you have envy? Are you jealous? Is there some like heretical things that you're thinking of? Like heresy is one of them. Dissension? Do you cause dissension with people around you? Like are you causing problems? Let's go over it one more time. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. 
of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us, all, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And I think something that's so important from this section of Scripture is like the way that Paul frames it. He calls it the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. How does fruit, how does fruit like come to be, like how does it germinate? Right, you plant a seed, you tend to it, you water it, you just keep cultivating it and then it creates a deeper root system. It starts to blossom, it branches out and then eventually fruit is born. What are works? You just do it. You do it. It's instant. This is what, like, we're being, like, what's being revealed to us is that the fruit of the Spirit comes from intentional time that we're spending with the Lord. Yeah. It's Him just working on us. It's not a quick and easy process. Your character does not change in a day. No. It does not change in a day. But if you look at God face to face as a friend and as He, in the secret place, and He takes you from glory to glory, your character is just going to change. The more time that you just spend with the Lord, that you abide in Him, that He's going to abide in you. The closer you draw near to Him, the closer He will draw near to you, and you'll just start to look more like Him. Yeah. But the works of the flesh are instant. They're gratifying. They serve you. It's all about this right here. Like, this is just going to be in the dirt one day if you just keep living like that. You know what I mean? Like you, Paul says in Romans, that whom you serve, like that's who you're a slave to. Like you could either be a slave to sin, leading to death, or slave of righteousness, leading to holiness. So that's one part. It's characteristically just becoming more like Jesus, believing the truth of what he says about you, spending time with him to know God. And not like, not a, not a knowledge base where it doesn't transfer to your heart, but a place where like you sit with the Lord, he speaks things over you, understand them, and it just transfers to your heart and you start loving people differently. And then it goes to your hands and your feet and you start working for the ministry. Like you start doing what he calls you to do. Okay? So it's just this character formation that happens in Christ. And later on when we um, might just have some ministry time at the end, just pray for people. I want you to just sit on these, the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. And which, which ones that you, which categories you'd say you fall into. So all of us do at times. All of us do. All of, a lot. But honestly, just evaluate for yourself and let the Lord just speak into that place because I, I know He wants to change people's hearts in this place. Yeah. And the second part about a spiritual mind, it's not the carnal mind. It's something I'm very, I'm very passionate about this. And it's Jesus building His church. It's like, what is our purpose? Like, I'm an, individu I'm an individual member of the body of Christ. Like, each of us jointly fit together. Like, we have one mission. Co-laborers for what Jesus, like, the mission that he gave us. Like, he left us with a task. He gave us something to do while we're here on earth. It's like, what is that? So Jesus, he talks to Peter, right? And what Peter confirms, that you are the son of God. Like, and, and Jesus restores his identity. He calls him Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail over it. That's a promise that Jesus said. 
Jesus lives, he does his earthly ministry, he's crucified. We're able to receive this atonement, enter into relationship with him, be raised again with him, right? Like this new life, being born again of the spirit. Jesus ascends, seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And in the book of Acts, the revelation that we receive is like, how is Jesus building his church? Because he said he'd do it. Like, do we believe that? Is Jesus right now seated at the right hand of the Father building his church? Yes, he is. And how is he doing it? Well, I think from all the promises prophetically from the Old Testament and what's revealed to us in the book of Acts is that he's doing it through the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Whoa. <laughs> like the Holy Spirit in the entire book of Acts would just go and the people would like submit under him. Like his people, the church. Like this, and I could just go through through all of it. Like the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and the, the centurion, all these Gentiles. Peter gets like this vision. He goes to this place and this happens. And then he comes back and it's like, well, I guess salvation is for the Gentiles. For now, like, we are able to be grafted in to this family of God. It was the leading of the Holy Spirit. Paul and Silas were praying with the elders. And they're praying, and the Holy Spirit set them apart for a mission trip that literally put, like, half the books, in, like, most of the books in the New Testament in here. Like, formed all, like, the Western church. It was the Holy Spirit, as they're praying together with the elders, set Paul and Silas apart, and they went on this missionary journey that started the church. Wow. Paul, as he's on the road to Emmaus, he's going to spread the gospel, he's going to go east, and he has this great plan. But then what happens? The Macedonian man, he has a vision of a Macedonian man, and all of these plans that made sense to him, and he was serving Jesus, he was doing the works. And he's like, oh, just go this way. I'm going to redirect your path. And this happened to Paul a lot where you'd go somewhere and God's like, eh, just take it this way. And every time, the fruit that was born, and it's amazing. Like where he went, like that funded his ministry for the rest of it. Yep. You know what I mean? Where it's Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, Father, seated in heaven. And the way that he's building his church through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is spirit and truth, y'all. This is spirit and truth. Get your Bibles. You want God to speak to you? Start engaging with Him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, don't just like sit on a rock somewhere and wait. <laughs> like, engage with Him. The, the Lord is speaking today. He's poured out His new wine. Upon all the flesh, he's poured out his spirit. And I feel like there's a call to unity here. There's a call to unity that's just specific over Pack Rim. Yep. It's beautiful. Yep. This is a place where. I'm so thankful to God yeah. for bringing me here yeah. to this school. Like, I thank God that he brought me here. Yeah. I'm just going to testify. Testify. Yeah. Yeah, God, like, five years ago, like, four or five years ago, he gave me this promise. One of the clearest times I heard the Lord's voice, he told me, Honolulu, Japan, Honolulu. I didn't know what that meant. I grew up, I, I wasn't Christian growing up. I didn't have any Christians around me. I just encountered the Spirit of God. Like, He came to me. And, like, that scene of, like, Psalms 18, where, like, David is encircled by, like, the depths of Sheol. It's like this huge army of, like, the enemy is encircling him. And, it's like, and Jesus comes on these water darkened storm clouds, mounted on a chair, and He picks him up and He saves him. Like, this great scene. I just feel that so deeply. I was in such a broken place and the Lord just saved me. And he called me here. 
He told me to come here and I tried to, I tried to plan it on my own volition. I tried to do it. Like for three years, I was like trying to get to Honolulu, but I was not accepting the call that God had on my life. He called me to do this for real. I ran away from this for so long. I found stages, mics or whatever, like so unattractive. People like elevating themselves. I'm like, dude, you can't run away from the call that God has on your life. And God has a call for the school. Yeah. So I came here three years later. It's crazy just circumstances, like crazy like trail of events. Bro, this life has been insane. <laughs> it's been wild. But to see the fruit of what God has done just from a simple yes. Yeah. From a step of faith yes. Come on. and obedience. Go there. God, I'm never going back. I'm never going back. I have my eyes fixed on one thing, and I'm never going back. And I just want to call us as a community to understand the call that he has on this school. Yeah. It's a unique place where God is raising leaders. Like we're being discipled. Like people here are called to Hawaii. Yeah. I believe that. That there are people here that will impact the ministry of heaven here on Oahu yeah. in the future. something that could just happen so easily yeah. to where we cause dissension where we think about things in this yep. Yep. in fleshly terms instead of like oh. the plans that God has for this school Come on. the plans that God has for each of our lives bringing us here yeah. I've just seen it I've seen people just be so tribal and like oh but I don't like what you're saying I don't like what you're saying like, when I was talking about Jesus building his church and it was through the Holy Spirit, why do you think the Holy Spirit is like the hotbed, like the biggest like contention in the church? It's because of the enemy. Yeah. He's good at his job. Yeah. Why do you think he wants us to fight about the Holy Spirit so much? Because the Holy Spirit is the way that Jesus is building his church. Let's go. So I just want us all to get to a place as a community. And I'll just pray for us afterwards as well. Yeah, come on. I want us to all to get to a place where we begin to, to look at things from a heavenly perspective. What God, what are you doing here? Not think about ourselves. And not think about our flesh. Like what is like what's best for me? No. How can you serve God's kingdom? That's why you're here. That's the purpose of our life, to bring glory to Him. Our, the purpose of your life is to bring glory to God. Amen. Accept that. Accept that. I feel like I wanted to just share one, one more story. And this is kind of talking about the spiritual mind versus the carnal mind. And just like an example in my life how that happened. So I, I, I work at this place. It's called The Counter. It's in Call of the Mall. If you like, come, come. Give me 15%. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, but I was working there for a while and my my perspective on work was always like third, like uh, Colossians 3, 23, like bond servants, like when you work, like work unto the Lord. Like everything you do, just work unto God. So I've like worked like a bunch of jobs before and everything was just like, like eh, you know, it's like whatever work. Like it just doesn't seem like it's building that much, like building to something. But God's just growing my character in these places. And I was just working like, all right, Lord, I'm just gonna work unto you. But every time I worked, like at the last couple of jobs I had, people just didn't like that I was Christian. My managers did not like that I was Christian, and they just revile me. Like, they just say all kind of stuff about me. Like, worst stuff that you could think of. These are my bosses. And they just say it all the time. 
and they say it about Jesus, they say it about me, and I'm like, if you say something about me, I don't, like whatever, I'll just take it, pray for you later. Uh, if you say something about Jesus, I'm standing on that. Because you're not going to like, oppose my God. But I got to this place where, dude, work was just tough. <laughs> like, I just get in there and they're playing all this music that's just demonic. <laughs> straight up. <laughs> like, straight up demonic. It's just terrible. And like, there's these people in the back that, like, I'd be like, can I get a, can I get a single fry? And, like, ah! and they start yelling everywhere. I'm like, bro. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, and my manager just kept pounding me, like, telling me all this stuff. Like, I'm like, dude, it just sucked. Like, coming to work every day sucked. I'm like, God, I'm trying to do this up to you. I'm like, oh, it's building character. It's a perspective shift. When I started to pray that the kingdom of heaven would invade my work. Where every day I would come in, and I just come in and I pray over my work. I pray over each and every single person at my work. And I just spend time with the Lord, just praying, God, show up, please. And when I'm at work, I would just be walking around and I'm praying the whole time. And the person that was giving me most problems, honestly, like right after I started praying, they quit. <laughs> it's crazy. But like after that, just so many testimonies. Like people just coming up after work, every, like daily now. It's just like, hey, can you pray for this? Can you pray for me? And like God would give me words. Like we have this one cook. And I just, the Lord told me that he had, he had a call on his life. He had a call on his life. And somebody had told him that when he was young. God told me this. And I brought it up. I'm like, hey, bro. Did somebody tell you when you were younger that you had a call on your life to like be a pastor? He's like, yeah, my grandma. And I've just been able to see, just prayerfully, faithfully walking in this, like contending that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that it comes here at work. And this is what I'm saying, like for every area of your life, in every relationship with your parents, with your siblings, with your friends, the house that you live at, your work, your areas of influence, that you pray that the kingdom of heaven breaks through. It's real, guys. Like I've seen lives transform. So if we could just all enter a place of prayer. And I'm just going to call a few people up to pray for people. That's all right. And after, if you have anything heavy on your heart, then just everybody close your eyes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That you came to establish your new and eternal covenant. eating of your bread, drinking of your cup, Lord, that we could enter into this life, God, that everything we do is unto eternity. No longer are we dirt returning to dirt, but we are spirit returning to our Heavenly Father. Come on. So Lord God, Abba Father, Lord, I pray that you may speak to your children. Lord, reveal to them and how you want them to come back to you. Reveal to them in any way where they've had a carnal mind, where they've thought of things in the physical sense, where they've been living a life under the sun. And God, I pray that you may usher us in as a community into a greater revelation of your kingdom and what you are doing in our lives, what you are doing here on this earth, God, what you are doing at Pack Rim, what you are doing on Oahu. Come on. So, Lord, our Father, God, just thank you 
Thank you for your plan. For your will for our lives. That you speak just so many good things over us. As numerous as the sands are the good things that you speak over us, God. Lord, you just care so much about us. So, Lord, Abba, Father, just pray that you may turn hearts to you today. May we be worshipers and spirit in the truth, true worshipers. I pray for anybody that hasn't received an experience of being born again in the spirit. Come on. Lord, may you give them new life. pray for each and every single person in here, Lord. May you drop dreams. Wow. May you drop dreams in this season, God. May you drop the, the purpose that you've given them. Each and every single person here has been appointed for a purpose in the kingdom of heaven. You serve a purpose. There's a reason God has you here, and it's to build his kingdom, to give him glory. So, Lord, I pray that you may drop this, this heavenly purpose in each person here's mind. Fill us afresh, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to have like a few people with uh, Brent. Did you come?